Good afternoon and hello, folks. Welcome to another Flycast Partners presentation. My name is Rich Longo and I'll be your host for today. And today's topic is on Sharewell's no code equals easy customizations. And I could not think of a better person to cover this topic other than Flycast Partners' very own Thomas Scheel. Now, Tom has been a senior consultant with Flycast Partners for over six years now and been involved in over 100, well over 100 sharewell related projects. He is certified in ITIL and has been instrumental in creating new ways for sharewell to assist with many different environments and verticals. Before we get started today, Tom, let me introduce Flycast Partners. Flycast Partners offers best-in-class implementation services and training in IT service management. IT asset management, IT operations management, enterprise service management, security, workload automation spaces, all using ITIL best practice. Our professional services team has well over 5,600 professional services engagements on site and remote, as well as an organization. We have over 1,200, that's right, 1,200 regular customers throughout Canada and the United States that continually come back. I encourage you to reach out to us at 844-FLYCAST. That's 844-359-2278. Or you can go to our website and chat with us. We're happy to chat with you Monday through Friday during normal business hours. They'll help you get data papers and white sheets and demos and training and remote administration services. And we're applicable uh, L1 or L2 support, which we do offer Sharewell L1 and L2 support. If you have any questions at all outside of calling us or through the website, you can also use email at info at flycastpartners.com. For questions about today's presentation, I want you to take that time to type those questions in the questions section of this go-to webinar, and I'll read those off to Tom. And Tom is going to answer as many questions as time will allow today during the time of our presentation. So don't be bashful. Type those questions in there. And Tom is more than happy to go ahead and answer any questions that you may have. Now, without further delay, I'm going to go ahead and turn this over to Tom. Tom, it's all yours, sir. Thank you very much, Rich. All right, let me see if I can get this shared properly this time. All right, there we go. Last time I shared the wrong screen. There, <laughs> um, you. there it is. Hey, yeah. everybody. I'm Tom Scheel. As Rich said, I am a senior consultant here at Flycast Partners. I'm going to be uh, talking a little bit about the no-code easy development, but then I'm going to show you what we've made because of that. And I can't, I don't have the entire time to give you all the details, um, but if you like what you see, you want to know more about it and how to how to do it, Please feel free to um, you know let us know, and we'll be more than happy to set up an extended demo um, of what we're doing here. Um, and, and then I'm going to leave some time at the end here for questions as well. So um, I do know we do have a couple different groups of people with us. Some who have used Shareable before, some who haven't. The main thing to know about the Shareable environment is that it is no code. And by that, we mean almost everything has a graphical user interface and it does all the work for you on the back end. The screen that we're showing in front of us is what we call our one-step um, editor, one-step manager editor. The, As you can see on the side here, we have a bunch of actions. And these actions are going to be able, what you use to do almost anything in ShareWell. You don't need to know Java or C++ or, or really anything in order to make these work. There is minor things you might want to know, XML, um, JSON, just basic formatting, if you decide to get to the super advanced stuff. But for the normal day-to-day, -day, you don't need it, even for I know companies who never go into using JSON or XML because you don't have to, that's what no code is about. You can accomplish any of these actions without it. So stuff like launching a URL, hey, that's let's drag that on here and now we can tell Sharewell to go to a web page. On top of um, just the one step editor here on top of these actions, they provide us with a bunch of different functions that we can use in addition to building our own expressions. So you have a logical statement, is this or is this not true, return true or false. You have uh, aggregate expressions to do sums, counts, totals. You have your case statements for if, thens, and just a plethora of others. It literally takes, it would take me all day to talk about how each one of these can be used in addition with how 
they're used within each of these actions that we see here. So I do just want to point out that anything that I've done in this system is purely off of relationships, field values, and these actions here, and then those expressions. Very, very easy to do without needing to actually code per se. So that does lead us to easy development. It's very easy to put these records together, these actions together, as long as you can think your way through it. I, I'm not lying when I say 90% of my job is just trying to figure out how it should work. Not how, figure out how to code it, but just how it should work. Think about all of the questions that somebody might not originally ask. Because once I know how it should work, I don't need to worry about how do I code it. I just say, oh, I'm going to do this action here and I'm going to put a condition on it so that it only executes at this point or something like that. That's all the, this, the easiest part of this. The hardest part is literally figuring out our way through it. Because of that development, this means you can do a lot of stuff that even, no offense to the Sherwell people who might be listening, that Sherwell may not have thought of themselves yet. <laughs> And that's what I want to show you. Um, once again, not a complete thing, but I, I do want to take you through some highlights. What I've developed here is a way to control workflows, not for incident, not for change requests, not for problems, all workflows in a very table driven format. This allows us to say, oh, when somebody is requesting a, an employee onboarding or a new employee setup, these are the actions we're going to take. And these are the times we're going to take them. If it's an IT contractor, a full-time, part-time, a contractor that only happens once I've gone through this step, and then just a, another IT contractor one down here. So depending on uh, values that are provided and conditions, we can actually execute very detailed workflows without the need of even the administration tool for ShareWell. So beyond just no code development, you can develop easier coding, like easier non-coding within here so that you don't even have to use the administration tool. And that's really where that power comes in. So this is a very complex workflow right here. I do happen to have a Visio diagram that we can spit out of ShareWell because of this. And this is great for documenting. Once you get a process worked out, you can easily document it by printing it out, stuffing it in a folder somewhere and then if somebody needs to change it hand them this piece of paper and say all right tell you know point to the little areas you want this to change and then once you go to put it in it's literally pulling the stuff from this table right here so you can make your one-to-one -one correlations and make adjustments so for instance i'm going to create a new ticket This will be for Andrew Sims. You can't see that I'm typing it out because I do it by memory, but new employee down here is our classification. And because of that, I get my new employee form. I have my departments. I'm going to go ahead and select him as IT and make him a contractor. With this, I, because of relationships and other information that I have, I can assign bundles automatically for what he gets based off of his job title and his department. And since this is a no-code environment, I can make that a lot simpler and change those values as well, whatever conditions I need them to be. So I've gone ahead and saved that ticket. It does take about a minute to generate, but you'll see that the information I get within that minute is actually pretty substantial. Um, when I while well, that works, so we can actually see we should be getting some workflow out there we go. Here's our blocks generating, and then each of those is going to generate some workflow actions. And then each of those workflow actions is going to have uh, an OLA on it. So not only the ticket SLA, but the OLAs here that are going to add up for each one of these. And then those will relay and they can turn into our ticket SLA if we need. So we have very customized timeframes for these. Like I said, it does take about a minute for everything we're getting, but we can actually see the exact items that are processing here as they do it. We can see when they set to trigger and how long they should take. 
And then these over here, mostly just for debugging, but they show the amount of time, you know, they have completed or the children actions have completed, so on and so forth. So we see we have a couple of tasks here. I can go close this. And go back to my parent ticket. That was just a real quick example I want to show you that it, it generated the wireless access and the setup desk because I had an item which utilized this workflow, which literally just has that one item in it. It doesn't need to be too complex or too fancy. And it happens for everybody for the all workflow. And then I also had this new employee setup where I didn't get a task for this item, but it did run because it doesn't generate a task. It just creates an AD account for that person and adds them to a specific o, um, OU in Active Directory. And then after that executed, because it was an IT contractor, I got this. So you can see that's where this workflow is coming into play here. Because I was, said my department was IT and I'm a contractor, I got just those items. If I want to modify this, let's actually go back to our ticket real quick. Oops, yeah. You can see some of my playing around with it. Same person over and over again. So I also generated approvals automatically based off of the, the uh, workflow for the two items that required that workflow. And as I can see here, there's that adding to Active Directory, assigning to an OU, followed by this one. And as I complete them, you'll see they do update themselves to say completed. And this will, like I said, it takes a minute, it's just a little bit behind. This will update itself to say it's 100% completed whenever it's done. So um, next, we said it was easy customization. So let's do that. Let's customize it. I want to change this. I actually want to say that uh, whenever my setup desk completes, I actually want to have it add a journal entry to the ticket that says, hey, I completed this block. And that's something really basic. I did, do already have a work unit set up for that so I can add it. I can go add a work unit. This is the one I'm referring to right here at the bottom. No, it's not for deprovisioning. And I've, it's been added here. Now I can make a few mo small modifications. I wanna say I need to assign it to a workflow. It works for everybody. And it's an inclusion versus an exclusion. If I had this as exclusion, that would execute for nobody. <laughs> the opposite of all is nothing. Now, so I'll move it for an inclusion. I'll go ahead and save that. And then add a dependency so that I can tell it. First, we're going to set up the desk. And then we're going to add, run our actions. Does it need to execute immediately? No, I don't want it to execute immediately. I want it to wait until that previous task closed. Hence why I selected that option there. So now that I've got that added, go back. Um, any of those, you who have used ShareWall, you may be familiar, familiar with the idea that normally this would have all required a blueprint change, publishing it through dev and then test and whatnot. No need here. Once again, I did just do that new employee on the bottom. You couldn't see that because of my resolution, but there you go. Following the same steps as before. Add bundle, there's all of our bundled items and we'll save. Once again, give it another minute for it to generate and then we'll work through our um, workflow all over again. And with any luck, we will see that we have, um, we'll have another task added on there. On our last ticket, we did see that there are some approvals 
well, because of the ability to, once again, no code, e easy development, I've actually built my own approval object within ShareWell. I'm, I, I like making it more table driven. So I created my own where I can go assign all of those. And this is that block that I've created. So I said that it's going to take a, a couple of a one customer approval and two team approvals. In this case, um, saying approval per member, plus I can put on approval waiting and a single, te single team approval. So any changes to my approval process are also table driven. And this means I can have very, very customizable uh, approvals that happen where I don't need to go and worry about blueprints, you know, making all those changes within blue blueprints. Sorry, cat got my tongue right there, a little dry. Uh, once again, I'll go in and close this. Mark it completed. And we'll see that we have this execute here in just a minute. Let's go ahead and oh, now we have our approvals generating. It may have seemed like those approvals took a little bit to generate, but the actual reason that they did take a little bit longer to generate um, is because they're on a delay action. I can actually tell them to delay for, a, you know, in my case, I think I put it for two minutes where they actually delayed two minutes after they were triggered. So this can go towards your offboarding process you know, trigger this to generate all the offboarding stuff somebody needs, but wait until their offboarding day to do so. Don't, you know, even though you put in the ticket two weeks in advance, let's wait until that day. That's something we can now do table driven as well. I can go ahead and approve this. Let's do Josh's approval. We'll say Josh or Sawyer approves it. And this is for two different items, so I'm going to provide the same person as approving it. And I just happen to know that my approval block is set up to only need two approvals. Let me go ahead and refresh here real quick. We did see that that item I added has already completed, in addition to already having been triggered at the completion of the setup desk item right here. So now I can come over here to my journals and see there it is. Block has been completed. And that's just a very basic indication of it. Um, it's just a very basic no, but I just wanted a basic um, addition to show you what it can do. I also noticed that all of my items for that have been completed. So it's 100% complete. And that has updated the overall completion of the ticket. And then I can also check my approval blocks. Notice that they've both moved to the approved status after I've generated my approvals. And that is going to then trigger even more actions to happen. So I have a very, very granular view of what's happening in the system for each individual ticket. Because my approval happened, I can now go and look at these. So if we go back real quick to the Visio diagram that I showed earlier, it starts and the first thing that happens is generate the approval block. If it becomes approved, I need a task called determine availability. And then if it gets approved, we also set our waiting to abstain. Admittedly, I don't have a denial flow on here yet, but it's very easy to add one. I'm just messing around with the approval side of it. So based off my availability, I can choose if I need to purchase or if it's in stock. And each of those will operate, um, will execute separate actions. I can take a look here and go to this task. And I see that I have my task specifics down here, which provide me this option no matter what I choose. So I'm going to say that this one's in stock. As you can see, I've been messing around with it, but let's go ahead and get Amy Desk. All I need there. And that one is done, so I will go back and then go do the other one.
once again, I can come down here. I see that there is task specific. This allows us to make sure that we require these entries before they can close the ticket. I don't need any additional data for the purchase because, well, in my workflow, I said I didn't need it. So as all that happens, we're actually going to see that I end up getting a purchase request for one of them because its workflow executes differently than the in um, the uh, in stock option. Also, as they update, we can see how much they actually should take based off that critical path, how much time is remaining and what percentage completed they are. And these will update as we trigger other actions. And we can see that each of those is triggering on their own. When I said it was in stock, I have a one step that automatically goes and updates that computer to be assigned to whoever the customer is. So I have automatic CI maintenance. The acquiring a laptop is, as you'll see in a moment, generating a purchase request. So there it is. So now I have a purchase request for one because I said, hey, I need to do a purchase. This other one, uh, since it's in stock, I just create a task to deliver the equipment. So that's an example of how we can branch off our statements based off of input. I haven't published a blueprint. None of this has required me to go into the admin tool. These can be live changes that can occur, or you can you know, put them through testing and development as with best practice. But the key being, this requires a lot less development on the back end. So it's a lot easier for people who don't know Sharewell to pick it up as long as they know the places to go, which is a you know part of on the job learning there. So um, I'm going to hold off for just a minute. Uh, Rich, do we have some questions? Anything that we I do? Can we do have questions. Okay, so let's bring up the first question here. What are some differences between ShareWell and a competitor product like OutSystems, and what differentiates ShareWell? I don't know about OutSystems. I don't have any direct experience with that, but I do know there are competitors out there, um, you know, ServiceNow, Avanti, some of those. What makes ShareWell different is typically you're going to see ShareWell is a lot less code. I, I mean, I'd say any other competitor that I've seen, they have a lot less coding um, than is required for those. Um, some other competitors also require a bigger team of people to manage it. Anywhere between, I've heard anywhere between seven to 14 people uh, for some competitor software, where ShareWell, you only re really need, you know, a team of maybe two to three at most is what I see at most companies. All right. And the next question I could probably answer myself with the acquisition of ShareWell by Avante, will ShareWell uh, replace the workflow builder inside the request offering? And how does Avante integrate with ShareWell today? Folks, this acquisition of ShareWell by Avante is very new to all of us. It hasn't even closed yet. They're in due diligence. And so we're all waiting to see how that pans out. So we don't have those answers for you as of today. Uh, let's give it a couple months till after that that acquisition completes and uh, they figure out what they're doing and the direction they're going and share that information with us. So for right now, uh, we're not going to be able to answer that question for you yet. First, the acquisition has to be complete. Uh, second question that we have is, is there no dev staging? How do you roll back or confirm a change that does not break anything? And that one is definitely for you. Uh, yeah. So, um, there is, with the layout that I have here, there is no rollback for this, but a change is also not permanent. As we saw in our template here, if I find out something broke something, I, I would recommend testing it in advance. Go into your test environment, you know, make these changes and test the workflow. But worst case scenario, if it does break, it's so easy to stop these because you have this workflow option. You know, like I said, if we change this to exclusion it no longer will execute at all because it excludes all um, and what this option does it says um in you know is this an do i include the items that fall within this group or do i exclude them so an easy way to turn it off would just be to mark that inclusion and it will take effect right away but as with any development i still do recommend you put it through a test or dev environment 
and and just make sure the workflow works first. But that being said, if you need that to go live, you don't need to worry about publishing a blueprint in the middle of a day of the day for your change request or wait till after hours. You can make that change live once you know it works. Okay, hey, next one. I, I don't think this is a question. Uh, I had not previously seen the announcement of Avante acquiring Sharewell. Should be a great combination. Michael, we couldn't agree uh, more with you. We think it's going to be a great, uh, great uh, marriage of the two two companies. So uh, definitely, we're all excited and looking forward to that. Uh, next question: Can AD integration automate further onboarding and offboarding? And that's from Mark. Yes, actually, for one of our other customers, um, we have a long term plan with them where I showed them this and the their, their head of IT or some high up executive said, oh, so you mean what we can do is we already have this one initiative to control access to software based off your Active Directory group. So you can use this to make the OU changes that would give them access to this so that you add them to a group and all of a sudden they just have access to the software. And I said, you've got it. He understood the 50 steps in advance that he could take this. Um, so yeah, you can make, you can use Active Directory depending on how you have your OU set up. You can make other Active Directory changes other than just OU changes, add people, remove people, you know, do whatever you need in Active Directory through PowerShell. Okay. Uh, and then I have several of you that are saying how great of a presentation this is and you want to share it with your coworkers. Um, definitely, folks, uh, if you do want a copy of the presentation when we're done today, go ahead and email me at rich.longo at flycastpartners.com. I'll make sure that, that we get that out to you or you can call us at 844-FLYCAST. That's uh, 844-359-2278. We'll make sure you get this. Uh, I do appreciate the, the fact that you guys uh, like this and we're going to let Tom go ahead and continue and please continue sending your questions by all means Tom is here to answer those questions for you live today thank you so yeah I am going to continue I did just want to take a chance um, since we have about 15 minutes left to make sure I started getting some questions answered um, like I said this demo normally goes a lot longer I'm, I'm actually starting to recommend about an hour and a half for it between questions and a proper time for explaining everything but I would like to continue. So I just want to make sure we got some questions out of the way. As we can see so far into our work on here, we have five days, two hours remaining estimated based off the work we've done. That doesn't mean that it's going to take that long. That's just providing an estimation for how long we think it will based off this critical path time. One thing I want to do want to share, show with you here is notice our times here. On one of them, we said that it was in stock. On another one, we said we had to purchase it. When I said that this was in stock, that critical path time dropped because it no longer had to go through the purchasing process, which the OLAs added up to be a lot shorter. So as you go through these workflows, it'll continuously recalculate that critical path. It's not just, you know, one of the things we run into the most often is, all right, I think that this is going to take five days, but sometimes it takes five, sometimes it takes two. It's really a gamble, you know? How how do I set up my SLAs? This allows you to control those conditions more granularly so that you have that better idea. The further you get into the ticket, the further you understand your critical path time and how close you are within that SLA for your continual service improvement. So I just wanted to pull show, show you that. And so... That's no longer 1.59 weeks like it started. Also, with our approvals, everything's been moved to abstained. I'm sorry, were you going to say something, Rich? Yeah, yeah. There's another question, and this might be something you can answer quickly. Do workflow changes, additions, and removals affect existing tickets or just new tickets after the changes were implemented? Existing tickets as well, because it works off of relationships that um, each of these right here, each of these workflow actions... All of those have direct relationships to these. So I have built relationships that link them over to these. So if you make a change in this, it goes live immediately for all tickets. But that's where that workflow option right here really comes into play because you can add a new workflow that says like, IT contractor pre-September the 5th and add that date as a constraint in your 
in your um, your decision making. So that way it does only affect new tickets, not old ones. Does that end? I hope that answers the question. I was about to ask Rich, does that answer your question when you have no idea? I, I, yeah, I don't know. Hector, let us know if that answers your question. Folks, keep sending the questions. Hector says yes. Thank you. Oh, you're very welcome. Yeah, and that's what I built this for is it, it really is provides a whole lot of flexibility with minimal blueprint changes. Um, that being said, it allows you to um, really it, it lets your it, it enhances the maturity of your organization because it drives that maturity. We um, put this in a place for one customer who had no experience with ShareWell. She came on. She had no idea. But I got an email maybe three weeks ago from her, and I worked with her about five, six months ago <laughs> um, saying, hey, I just needed to let you know people are just raving about the onboarding process, the offboarding, and I'm able to make the changes I need without, you know, now she was stuck in her own head. She was so worried. Oh, this looks too complicated. And then we showed her and she's like, oh, well, never mind that. <laughs> So this this does have we, we wanted to provide as much flexibility as we could while also understanding that people take time to learn share well. So give them some ease of use um, at the same time. The um, I was going somewhere else with that. Can't remember for the life of me now. That's OK. Let me do this and continue on here. So um, this is my purchase request that got created. As we can see, the item requested is marked as the Microsoft Surface Pro. That's what I had requested a purchase for. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and choose a generic laptop. This one I have not fully modified yet. Reason being, this actually was part of a different map that I'm just kind of utilizing. So I need to override the approval here. Come on. Thank you. As soon as I can keep my mouse still. All right, we're marking this ordered. Now, what I have tied into my piece is this receiving. Now that I've received it, that's where I have my workflow triggered to go update the other ticket. So, um, so I can go back to my incident here. And here in just a moment, I will see another task pop up. Let me go ahead and close my wireless access task while I'm doing it. And then um, show you one of the other benefits of this. So, like I said, this is this does work into Sherwell's no code development. I'm not a I, I am a developer, but I'm not a coder. Um, I'm I'm a database guy. My degree is in database management, so I know some SQL, but I don't know a lot of other stuff. I had to do some googling when I wanted to get involved in XML. So I am not by any means somebody who knows a lot of code, and this is not a lot of complicated stuff behind the scenes. It's just stuff that makes sense. Um, as I like to say, the CERN Super Collider, is it complex? Yes, it is very complex machine. It has to be. Is it complicated? It's not complicated for what it needs to do. It might be seem complicated, but that's because you com you're confusing complicated with complex. It needs to be complex, but for what it needs to do, it's not overly complicated. Same concept here. Every step that this does makes sense. You you make it circle back around to itself and invoke the same actions over and over again, just like best coding practices. But it's not that hard to follow when you when you look at you know beneath the scenes so to speak it's not that hard to follow at all um so let me refresh here let's see where we're at so we can see our times are updating i completed my wireless access request i still have a couple things to do here unbox master tag and phone yep so now that i've received it from my purchase request I can, you know, just continue on with the workflow. I'll get a, a task for, hey, it needs to be delivered and stuff like that. However, what this also adds into is now that I've onboarded somebody, as they submit more and more requests for stuff, I also have it linked in to remove items if they need it removed or um, track what they've been given. 
And that's what this table does. You can see I've done it, you know, lots of testing on it. So it's the same stuff over and over again. But what this does is it links what somebody has been given to the tickets that gave it to gave it to them. And then if it needs to be removed, it'll bring in the ticket that needed to remove it as well. And that comes in with our offboarding. So now that I have this table showing what they were given, I can create my service catalog template offering here that says when I when there's you know, separated from the company, step through each of those items. And if if it's within that workflow, take away that item instead of adding it. I have all those details to automate the offboarding of somebody as well. And um, another example here I have is removed from the shareable users. It's just the opposite effect of what happened on another one. If I had done a new software request, one of my options is if they request ShareWell, I can make an API call into ShareWell to automatically add them as a ShareWell user. This is something normally you would have had to contact the admin and say, oh, can you go ahead and add them and then put them on this team? No, you can do that through an API call automated so that those admins never have to get involved. You don't suffer any delay and they don't suffer any extra workload. So it really puts that streamlines the processes. All right, let's go ahead and see about any more questions. Wait, what do we got there, Rich? Uh, nothing new as of yet. We do have cool. just a couple moments left, folks. So if you have questions, now's the time to ask while we still have some time. And that gives me time if they're not if they don't have any more questions to go into. Let's go take a look back at approval blocks, which is something I really wanted to revisit. So I'm glad I kind of have the time to do it. Um, so. For those of you who've used Cheryl before, know you have the approval engine. And I'm, you know, you can also do your own approvals through the automation processes. I took that a step further and combined the two. So I created an approval block business object that will do everything that the Cheryl approval engine can do. And to anybody who's here from Cheryl, I'm not not I'm not not putting it down, but this can do more. Sorry, it just can. Um, like I said before, I can wait my approvals um, so that if my threshold is two, if I only need two people to approve it and this person's approval is weighted at 75 percent, when they provide their approval, they're worth 1.5 towards that two. Same thing on a denial. Um, I also can create a dynamic type. So a dynamic versus static is static is it's going to be sent to the same person every time. Dynamic is I'm going to rely on a one step to go get that information for me. I could send an approval to my CEO, second cousin, three times removed, as long as I have access to that information somewhere. I also have the ability to, um, just like the engine, I can do team level approvals and I can either send one to the entire team or one to each person on that team. And if you see, we have this thing keep popping up, deferral override. We have added the ability to defer an, um, an approval. So if somebody has not actively made the decision, but they want you to know that they've gotten it, because um, that was another complaint we heard quite often is, well, my approval is either approved or it's waiting, or denied or waiting. There's no, and how do I even know that they've seen it? deferred is that option it allows them to say i'm deferring this just i'm not i'm not saying yes i'm not saying no i'm just saying i'm thinking about it um just so that the customer knows oh somebody's got it it means that they're looking at it um the deferral override means if this is a vp or something who the decision cannot be made without their input it won't make that decision even if these thresholds are reached until they've provided that input um, there is actually one enhancement that I haven't put in here yet that I, I'm going to because my last customer who wanted this recommended it and I put it in place for them. And that is a prompt type. So you have dynamic, you know, let them determine or static, use the same person over and over again. But the prompt type allows the person to select the approval at the time that this is generated. And if it's generated via a back end, like an automation process or 
um, you know, webhook, anything like that, then you can set a default approver so that it doesn't get gummed up in the works because nobody's there to make the selection. You can set a default approver. So that's the approval side of this. We have got four minutes left and I'm not out of stuff to talk about, but I'm trying not to get too much into the weeds and get us stuck with like no time left. And I'm halfway through and talking about an object. All right. So, so we, no more questions. we have no more questions, but you do have four minutes. So if you can show something. Okay, cool. Yeah. So let's see what else. Um, in case you haven't seen them, here's your chance. In case you haven't upgraded to Sharewell 10.1.1 or later, they have action blocks and um, webhooks in those versions. And those are particularly awesome features. Um, an action block, a good use for that that I thought up today in case you are aware of these and want to do it. This is a great way of making API calls to other systems. Because if you just use your parameters to say what method you're calling and here are the details for that method, you can set up one action block that has multiple API methods with a branch statement, depending on what that input is. So what this one step action block does, for those of you who don't know, is it takes, it's got all the same capabilities as what I showed you earlier except it allows for parameters to be input into it. So you set up all these different parameters and then you use them down here, down the line. And that's just an, an added benefit that you can really opens up a whole world of possibilities. Um, the other added item is webhooks, which are also, I uh, can't get to them from here, but I do, I think they're awesome. A webhook is, let me go here and show you. I don't have one set up in here, but I'll show you the tool. A webhook is essentially you have your API destination and then you can give it a name. All right. And so you would actually take this URL and make an HTTP post command to it with some sort of a, a payload. And usually like a JSON payload. Um, Salesforce is a good example. Um, if you use Salesforce, the payload could be a bunch of information about the case, the account, and the contact, which translate into Sherwell as um, location, customer, and case is incident. And what happens is when that payload gets delivered, you can do whatever you need to normally. You have OPA access to all these tools based off of a single API call instead of multiples. So if you get one payload that has all, all three of those, you know, location, customer, and um, case, see webhook there, there's the body. You can actually tell Sharewell to say, okay, look to see if this location exists. If it doesn't, then create it. Then look to see if the customer exists. If it doesn't, create it then create the ticket and apply both of that location and customer to it. In the normal API, that would take like six to eight calls possibly, to de depending on what you're trying to do. With webhooks, it's a single call that the one step takes care of all of it for you. And that leaves me with one minute. Do we have anything else, Rich? There are no additional questions. That's the end of it. And I guess we'll just close right here, Tom. I want to thank you for your presentation today. It was very insightful. And uh, I think that our audience got a lot out of it. We had some great questions. I actually really like those questions. So, yes, great questions, guys. <laughs> so those of you that did not ask your questions and still have questions, by all means, give us a call at 844 podcast that's 844-359-2278 or you can chat with us live on our website our folks are standing by monday through friday uh, during normal business hours they would love to chat with you that is what they're there for to answer questions provide you with materials training or whatever it is that you might need or you can email us at info at flycastpartners.com those of you that had questions about um getting a copy of this presentation to share within your departments or with other coworkers. 
please email me at rich.longo at flycastpartners.com. That's rich.longo at flycastpartners.com. I'll make sure that we get that recording out to you when it becomes available in the next few business days. Also, every time uh, we do one of these, uh, if you're in attendance, for those that attend, you're entitled to a $10 Domino's gift card. Uh, Those do come from Domino's, folks. Please keep in mind, when those come in, they come directly from Domino's themselves, and sometimes they end up in your spam box. So go ahead and check. But Domino's has five Five business days, five business days to deliver those. So they have till the close of business on Wednesday to make sure those are delivered. So if you give it till Wednesday afternoon before you reach out, I'd appreciate it because that's that's when they have to deliver them. Uh, and with that being said, thanks again, Tom. Thank you. Thank you, Rich. Audience, thank you for taking time out to visit us today and, and enjoy our presentation. We know how busy you are and stay safe until our next uh our next webinar, podcast, or whatever live event that may be.